Hello to everyone. I'm Audrey Trushke. This is the second part of our of the Aurangzeb talk where I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I think it'll take people a few minutes to sort of, you know, come over, find the, find the video. Um, so, so, you know, hopefully people are finding us and joining us. Uh, and then if you have questions, just, you know, put, put them in the comments and I will be happy to answer them. Oh, thank you, thank you. So yeah, and as I said, I'm I'm happy to answer questions about you know my research about Aurangzeb about you know being a hated historian whatever whatever is sort of on your mind that you want to know more about. You want to get your hands on the non-Indian version, so. Okay, so for you know, for for the map, I guess I never posted the map, but okay, the most important alterations that I did make uh, were to the chapter on Shivaji. Okay, I, I made alterations other places in the book, but it was more just rewording. It was really the Shivaji chapter that I had to take out historical information. There, there are certain bits of historical information uh, that that are um, very unpalatable, shall we say, to some modern defenders of Shivaji. If you are interested, I did post the entire Shivaji chapter in its unedited form on my website. Okay, my website is just my full name, audreytrushke.com. Uh, if you go to the, I forget what I call it, I, you know, the publications tab, um, I do link to uh, a PDF of the full unedited chapter that I took from the Pakistani edition. Okay, I, I did not have to censor the book in, in Pakistan in that way. All right, hold on, I'm going back, going back to the comments here. Can you explain the relationship between... Um, okay, so I'm, I'm getting a lot of comments, folks. So, okay, I'm going to have to sort of be selective, but if I miss stuff, you can always ask again and I can circle back to it. Okay, how was the book received in, in Pakistan? Um, so, generally a positive reception, right? I, I, I don't have a lot of problems in Pakistan at the moment. Um, you know, there are parts of the book that do not sit very well with, with I think, many not all, but many modern Pakistanis. Um, you know, I, I shatter, you know, I, I shatter the sort of Aurangzeb as an anti-Hindu maniac myth, but I also shatter Aurangzeb the pious, and I name that as a myth in the book, right? You know, he was this sort of Sufi talismanic Islam guy, right? You know, definitely not, you know, orthodox as we understand orthodox Islam today. And that sort of pierces um, at the heart of why many people, not everyone, but many people in Pakistan like Aurangzeb, right? He was, you know, the one truly good Muslim king, like he was a real Muslim, all this stuff. And then I come along and I'm like, yeah, he hung out at Sufi shrines, he employed all these Hindus, like, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I will say that a big difference, though, is that when my book has caused controversy in India, uh, much of that controversy has been, you know, this terrible hate mail and threats of violence. In Pakistan, it's more, you know, uh, you know, people will say, I disagree with that. I don't think that's right. And then we like, you know, go have tea together or like move on and act like normal, normal people. Um, so, so there hasn't been a sort of more, more extreme pushback. Um, what are the reasons for misportraying Aurangzeb? Um, so it, it, it sort of, I mean, it goes back to the beginning. Uh, let me give sort of two trajectories. One has to do with the British. Uh, so, so the British come along and they have a really hard sell job. Okay, British colonialism was a terrible, it was a thing. It was oppressive, it was racist. Um, like British colonialism is as close to unjustified as, as you're ever gonna get. And how do you justify that, right? How, how do you get the cooperation of a large enough number of Indians in order to succeed with British colonialism? And the British needed to do that. So one tactic that the British had was saying, hey, at least we're better than the guys before us. Okay, and the Mughals were the guys before them and Aurangzeb was, was the sort of number one guy that they picked on to hate. Um, and so it sort of builds on that. Keep in mind that you know, British colonial era scholarship, many people still use it today, right? Many people still cite British era translations um, and I do as well to some degree, but I think that we should be more critical of it than many people are. Otherwise we risk perpetuating their biases. Another thing that I'll mention, this is the second trajectory, is that there are certain things about Mughal historiography um, and texts produced during Aurangzeb's reign or shortly thereafter that you know sort of don't read so well today. 
So a good example of this concerns temple destruction. Okay, the Mughals exaggerated the number of temples that they destroyed because to them it was a virtuous thing, right? Um, so you have the you have these writers that will say, oh yeah, Aurangzeb like destroyed you know hundreds of temples or he destroyed you know all this stuff, um, and it's not true, and we can we can prove oftentimes that it's not true. But not everyone wants to know the real history, right? It's very easy to sort of seize upon it and say, oh, well, they said it, right? The Mughals admit it. Um, you know, and to, and to understand why that's inappropriate to do, uh, it really goes back to historical method, right? Just because someone wrote it down several hundred years ago doesn't mean it's true. You have to read critically. Okay. But that, those are some reasons why you get this, this misportrayal. Let me also note that uh, today, it, you know, it just like it, just like misportraying Aurangzeb uh, or selectively portraying him anyways, served the British very well in their ambitions. Uh, it now serves Hindu nationalists very well, right? It's a very effective political tool, okay? Uh, okay, thank, oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, go, do the Shah Jahan favored Darsh Ko and Aurangzeb hating his father. Uh, I don't think Aurangzeb hated his father. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I've ever seen evidence of that. Um, that said, as a historian, I guess, you know, but, Personal feelings are not sort of chief on my list of, of things to figure out. I mean, how would I figure out if Aurangzeb really hated his father and why would I care? What I care about was that he overthrew his father, right? That 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 is something that had real impacts. Um, you know, Shah Jahan definitely favored Dara Shako. There's no doubt about that. We have ample evidence of that. Um, but Shah Jahan really didn't do Dara any favors with that, right? You know, Dara couldn't control a battlefield to save his life literally at the end of the day. Um, he didn't have the networks that he needed to become the next Mughal king, right? His father's love and praise and keeping him close at court uh, did not serve Dara well at, at the end. Um, what is my opinion on Aurangzeb and his siege of Golconda? Um, I, I think it was remarkably effective, right? So that that was, I mean, the, the siege itself is not what really brought Golconda down. I guess it led to it. Um, I mean, you know, the siege was happening, people were dying, right? I mean, sieges are very brutal affairs. Um, but then uh, Aurangzeb tricked, it. he didn't trick a guy, he he convinced a guy to un leave the gate unlocked, right? One night um, and the Mughals swarmed the fort and took it within hours. You know, Aurangzeb used every tactic in warfare, right? He would beat you on the open battlefield and he would sneak in in the dead of night and take your fort, right? It didn't, like the means were not all that crucial to him. It, it was the victory. Um, and I think that the taking of the Golconda fort, you know, it, it was an impressive military feat and it expanded the Mughal empire. Um, it's also sort of one of the last real successes of Aurangzeb's Deccan Wars, right? After that is when the strategy becomes a little iffy. Um, you know, the last 20 years of Aurangzeb's life Many historians have wondered, like, why does he just continue wandering around southern India? Why is it said that he did forced conversions? Because it's politically convenient to say that. Right? So, sorry, let me, the question is, why is it said that Aurangzeb did forced conversions? It said that because it's politically convenient, right? It serves people's political interests to say that. Um, Aurangzeb did not do forced conversions. Uh, there's actually pretty ample historical evidence that he would question whether conversions were accurate or not. Um, and, and would, you know, if they were not sort of genuine or he didn't feel that they were genuine, uh, he would, he would ask for, for them to be, you know, sort of un, undone. Um, you know, I think a key to understand here is that Aurangzeb was an emperor first and foremost. He wanted to rule land and control territory. I mean, we didn't want to convert people on, on a mass scale. Now that said, Aurangzeb didn't mind it when people converted, um, except when it was inconvenient. Sometimes it was politically inconvenient and then, then he didn't like it. But in general, he didn't mind when people became Muslim. Akbar, by the way, didn't mind that either. Okay, so that's consistent with the Mughal kings. Um, but there was never conversion on a, sort of on a mass scale and on a state-led, you know, there, there, during his reign. Why is only Aurangzeb hated on the Mughal line? Well, uh, so as I said, there are sort of particular things about Aurangzeb that I think if you're gonna pick one Mughal emperor to hate, you know, I hate to do the British, but they picked the right guy, all right? Um, you know, all the military successes um, obviously led to a death toll under him. You know, he's the last great emperor, so you can sort of blame him for the empire falling apart, even though that didn't happen under him, right? He's the obvious guy to hate. 
but he is not the only Mughal hated today. Right? Where we're seeing a rise in anti-Mughal sentiments. I mean, it seems so odd to say that, right? A rise in hating people that haven't been around since the mid-19th century, but we are seeing that in India right now. Um, and it includes Akbar as well. Did Aurangzeb lose his ancestors' net worth by the end of his rule? No, he was the richest man alive in his day, right? Um, so no, absolutely not. Now it is a more complicated question about whether Aurangzeb sort of stretched the empire too thin and so made it brittle so that it would sort of crack apart soon after his death. That, that's a more complicated question. And I'm still unconvinced, frankly, about why the Mughal empire ultimately fell apart and sort of, you know, there's obviously going to be multiple answers, it's not going to be a single storyline, um, but I'm not entirely convinced of, you know, where we should apportion blame, so to speak. Okay, whoa, this is a long one. Um, oh, how about the 6072 we're calling endowed lands? Um, yeah, he does order that. Okay, hold, the, sorry, I'm trying. I'm trying to put this in in a way. Okay, the jizya. Let me go with the jizya part of this question. So th this is this is one thing that that Aurangzeb has been criticized for ever since, and he was criticized for in his day, which was reinstituting the jizya tax. Right, the jizya. Is is a discriminatory tax that is typically levied on non-Muslims in an empire. Aurangzeb reinstitutes it in 1679, uh, and he does it. He he levies the jizya on most non-Muslims, although m many people are exempt. Okay, so so Brahmins don't have to pay it. Um, so you know some Rajputs in the service don't have to pay it, so on and so forth. Okay, you know Aurangzeb is criticized for this at the time, including by members of his family. And his older sister, Jahanara, thinks that this is like a terrible, terrible idea. Many of his officials do as well. You know, I, I, I honestly, I leave a little bit of wiggle room in my book on this point um, because I, I found conflicted evidence on the jizya and I was just not fully convinced. By the way, that's something that happens sometimes with historians, right? Sometimes you, you just, you don't, you don't have enough evidence, right? You're not fully convinced one way or the other. But my best guess about why he did it doesn't really have to do with money. It has to do with the ulama. Okay, the jizya was collected by a special class of tax collectors, not the normal guys. Okay, and the special class of, of tax collectors were drawn from the ranks of the ulama. Now, the ulama, the traditional learned men of Islam, they had been a problem for the Mughals basically since the beginning. Okay, now Akbar, he liked to just he liked to sort of go more strongly against the ulama. Okay, you know, if, if they upset him too much, he would send them packing to Mecca, which was a nice, you know, go, go on Hajj was a nice way of saying, like, get out of here and never come back. Aurangzeb would do that as well. Okay, he did send problematic members of the ulama on, on Hajj, right? Like, get out of my empire. You know, I'll, I'll see you in, in several years when you're no longer a political threat sort of deal. He fired members of the ulama uh, who gave him trouble. But more often than not, Aurangzeb preferred placating the ulama. And I think that at least a likely significant reason why he brought back the jizya was because it gave them a lot of employment. There's fairly, we don't have uh, clear Mughal tax records, by the way, from Aurangzeb's rule, so we don't know how much money the jizya brought in, but most likely uh, a lot of it was skimmed off the top. Okay, the ulama pocketed a lot of that money. Okay, so or this is the question. Aurangzeb said when he was on his deathbed that he really came and left as a stranger, right? And he went so far as to call himself a sinner. How do I contextualize this with his view of justice, Adel? So I think that there is sort of, Aurangzeb has a number of end of life reflections, right? Where he sort of says, I failed, God hates me. Uh, he has lines where he says, I think I'm going to go to hell, things like that. And I think that there's sort of two ways to read it. And I, I don't see a reason why we can't do both. I think in part, he said those things because you were supposed to say those things. This is part of sort of Persian, right, in Persian poetry and how an old man is supposed to talk about, about his life and sort of repent for his sins. So I think there's a sort of playing into expectation, right, and sort of using certain poetic tropes. But I also don't see any reason not to think that Aurangzeb at least in part, didn't also mean it, right? Maybe he meant it. As I said, he chose power every time. 
right? Sometimes he chose piety, sometimes justice, sometimes Mughal kingship, but when raw power was on the line, he always chose it, right? He never gave up territory, right? Or anything like that. And so I, I think that perhaps, you know, when you're old and on your deathbed, I mean, it was in his late eighties when he died, right? So he was frail for a long time. And I think maybe looking back, he thought, you know, th this might not go so well in the, in the afterlife scenario. Um, Aurangzeb's relationship with his sisters. All right, so this is the question. Can I talk about Aurangzeb's relationship with his sisters, Roshanara and Jahanara? So uh, th there were several sisters, right? There's more than that um, as well. So, okay, the, the sisters, uh, one big moment comes during the War of Succession when the sisters basically sort of break in who they support. Right, so Jahanara supports Dara Shiko. I think it's Rosh Roshanara uh, supports uh, Aurangzeb. Um, you know, after that, everyone sort of comes back together, right? Like, you know, ministers are exiled, beheaded, or anything like that. Uh, that said, you know, I have honestly not done a ton of research into women in the Mughal Empire. Um, and it's honestly, it's something I have been criticized for, and I think it's a fair criticism. Um, and in in my sort of next go around with, with Mughal history, so I'm coming out with a book that's not specifically about the Mughals. After that, I may return to the Mughals. I write more about women because I think it's a very fair criticism this male centered nature of my work thus far um okay that's the like, questions um did Oren ever regret killing Dara not that I'm aware of I've, I've never seen any regret no but you know it may, it, so this is something that, that, that it, um, the sort of Mughal fratricide kind of infighting and killing brothers and, you know, imprisoning dads and stuff like this, it, uh, it really upset or it, it sort of, upset is the wrong word. It struck European observers at the time, right? There were a bunch of European travelers in India during the War of Succession, and it struck them as very barbaric, right? Now, keep in mind that European travelers, many of them were sort of looking for reasons to view Indians as barbaric, right? So it sort of played into their, their biases. Um, this, it really was normal, right? You know, Orang, it's not like Aurangzeb grew up in some loving family and then it was like, oh no, when I'm 40, I have to kill my brother. This is gonna be so hard, right? Like from the moment that Aurangzeb was old enough to know anything, he knew that only one of them would survive, right? he knew he was gonna have to kill Dara. Um, you know, Dara would have killed him too. You know? So it, a different set of family family dynamics. Right? So, you know, for, for those of us have, you know, who are in lockdown and quarantine with family, and you know, you think you have messed up family dynamics, right? It, it, just think about the moguls, it could be worse. Um, is Aurangzeb controversial for Muslims? Some see him as almost a saint, whereas others are somewhat ambivalent. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I, I think that specific Muslim communities have their sort of own visions of, of Aurangzeb. Um, you know, like I said, a big difference is that I have never faced the, the sort of virulent, angry pushback. It's, it's been much more sort of calm, right? You know, we can agree to disagree, right? Um, you know, when, when you write a historical biography, especially for a popular audience, you don't expect everyone to be convinced. You don't expect everyone to agree and to like it. That's fine. Uh, what not everyone expects is to receive a bunch of death threats because of it, right? So that, that again remains the big distinction, right? It's it, you know, it, it's Hindu nationalists are not the only group of people that are not happy about my ordering the book. Um, they're just the only ones that have threatened to kill me over it, right? Um, okay, religious conversions we did. Do I think Aurangzeb was a victim of his time then or a victim of time now? I don't think he's a victim. Um, uh, you know, I mean, he, he was, you know, one of the most powerful men in the world ever. Um, incredible historical figure. You know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't feel sorry for, for Aurangzeb Alamgir. Um, I think that throwing him around as a political football now and the sort of anti-Hindu genocidal maniac, mythical Aurangzeb, um, you know, this this has a couple of real harms from my perspective. Uh, the biggest one is that it hurts modern day Muslims, particularly in India, right? Um, Anti-Muslim sentiments are growing rapidly in India right now, 
right? Um, you know, for those who keep up on the news just last week, the USCIRF, which is a, a watchdog group based in the United States that tracks religious freedom, they just put India on their of sort of worst countries for religious freedom, right? Putting it on par, you know, with, you know, places like North Korea. They're recommending targeted sanctions by the United States on India as a result of this. Um, I mean, you know, in India, we've seen pogroms, right? And just in February, um, you know, various police forces are using the lockdown to sort of, you know, you know advance anti-Muslim agendas. Aurangzeb comes into this because he's a dog whistle. Right, you hate on Aurangzeb is a way of saying, oh, it's okay to hate on present day Indian Muslims. It's okay to oppress them. It's okay to kill them. Right, that that cost in human life is is horrific. There is additionally a historical cost. Right, every time that people think about Aurangzeb the myth, they're not thinking about Aurangzeb the man. Right, and it becomes harder to sort of pierce the haze and smoke of our present and and get back at at the real historical figure, um, which which of course is is what I, I want to do. Okay, so I'm being directed to select three more questions. Let me do three more. Okay, no, Shivaji. Okay, several of you have asked about him. So let me let me just talk a little bit about Shivaji. So Shivaji was a real pain for Aurangzeb. Okay. Um, and that is because Shivaji, he was a master at, at guerrilla warfare in particular. Um, I mean, it's really incredible if, if you're impressed by military strategy that a guy with relatively few resources um, as compared to, you know, the mighty Mughal emperor was able to be such a thorn in his side. Um, Aurangzeb did beat Shivaji once, right? There was a brief moment where Shivaji submitted to Mughal authority, um, but then he escaped from, from Aurangzeb's court. If I, a couple of key things to know about the Shivaji-Aurangzeb conflict. Um, one, it wasn't about religion. Okay, Shivaji didn't, didn't, didn't hate Aurangzeb because he was Muslim. Aurangzeb didn't hate Shivaji because he was Hindu. They hated each other because they were in military conflict, okay? Um, you know, one sort of concrete tidbit to see that is that the one time Shivaji's Mughal army manages to actually, or sorry, Aurangzeb's Mughal army manages to actually beat Shivaji at Parandar Fort, um, Aurangzeb wasn't there, all right? The army was led by Jai Singh, okay? So a Hindu Rajput beat Shivaji, okay? That's, that's one thing to know. Um, you know, that said, the hatred was real between between the two of them, right? Um, Aurangzeb somewhat inf infamously called Shivaji a mountain rat, right? All right, second question I'll take. It's popular belief that Aurangzeb didn't patronize much cultural activities like architecture, paintings, music. So what was the reason behind that? And given that, how did I manage to complete my research work? So this is a mix of falsehood and truth. Okay. It is true that Aurangzeb did certain things. For example, he reassigned his court musicians about 10 years into his reign. Okay, note that he didn't fire them. He just reassigned them to other stuff. Um, but he didn't ban music throughout the Mughal Empire. Uh, there are more musical treatises, I believe, written in Persian during Aurangzeb's reign than any other point up, you know, in, in Indian history. What he essentially did was sort of diffused talent. We're a little bit less clear about paintings. There don't appear to be a ton of paintings from Aurangzeb's atelier, but there are a lot of paintings of Aurangzeb. So again, maybe just dispersed talent a little bit, uh, which can actually be very, very good for artistic flourishing. Helps explain why there was flourishing under Aurangzeb in this, these regards. Um, I would say of all the things that Aurangzeb did, the one that, you know, sort of cuts me to the quick and pains me the most was that he fired his court historian. And he did that a decade into his reign. So we have the Alamgir Nome for the first 10 years, but then after that, we're relying on histories from, you know, sort of elsewhere, not, not coming out of the central Mughal court. Um, and I really wish, I wish I knew why, and I really wish he hadn't done that. Um, so it is true that, that Aurangzeb was sort of not as into centralized patronage as the, some of his the earlier Mughal kings, but it's not true that he tried to tamp down on this overall, right? It just sort of wasn't in his central court. Oh, all right, I'll end with this one because it, it gets back to modern times. Okay, can I shed some light on the state of the Indian economy during the Mughal, during Mughal rule, since it seems to be a trending topic of contention? So, uh, this, yeah, this has come back in the last, you know, several days, weeks, something like that. Um, this, this idea that the Mughals, um, 
you know, that, that they sort of drained India of wealth. Um, so the short answer is that that's not true. Okay, the British drained India of wealth not the Mughals. Um, and if you're wondering sort of why that displacing is happening, um, that really goes back to the, the roots of Hindutva ideology and, and the RSS in particular, right? The sort of, you know, parent uh, Hindu nationalist organization. Um, you know, so when the RSS was formed in the mid-1920s, uh, they pretty quickly directed their members to not participate in the Indian independence struggle. Right, they, they didn't have a real problem with the British, right? For them, the British were not the enemy, Muslims were the enemy. And if you're looking, you know, Muslims in the present were the enemy, but also Muslims in the past, of which the Mughals are the sort of prime example, right? They're, they're the biggest game in town in terms of Indo-Muslim empires. So they're the sort of, you know, ones that you want to hate. So this displacing of, of blame from the British who messed everything up to the Mughals who allegedly messed everything up, right? This has been going on for a hundred years, okay? And it, it's part of a much darker history uh, that has to do with, you know, basically light collaboration with, with British colonialists um, and a sort of hating on a group internal to India um, rather than one's colonial masters for, for 200 years. Now, um, it's also just false, okay? The, the Mughals didn't, didn't send wealth outside of India, right? I mean, they sent gifts, you know, you send gifts to the Ottomans, you send some money to Mecca, stuff like that. Uh, the Mughals also brought in a lot of gifts. Um, so, it, I mean, it's just not true that, that the Mughals drained India of, of its, its wealth. Now, that said, we do not have very extensive fiscal records from Mughal India, okay? We, we have a sort of snapshot picture during Akbar, that's preserved in the Akbar Nami, but we don't we don't have regular daily records, you know, tax receipts, stuff like that. Um, you know, much of that's just been lost, right? Uh, Mughal archives have been ransacked a number of times throughout throughout history. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I suppose, you know, historians we work on the basis of positive evidence rather than sort of continually disproving counterfactuals, right? So, you know, keep this in mind when, when people throw out stuff about the Mughals, you know, or about Aurangzeb, you know, oh, he tried to convert Hindus. Oh, he destroyed thousands of temples, right? One strategy is rather than ask the historian to disprove it, ask whoever is saying that, what's the evidence, right? Because that's the starting point for the historian is, is what, what is the evidence for this? So with that, Folks, we are gonna, going to have to cut it off. And I am sorry that I didn't get to all the questions, uh, but you know, who knows how long lockdown and quarantine will go on. Maybe we'll have the opportunity to do this again in a different venue or something like that. So I hope that everyone has, has a great day. Bye now.